Um, before I start, do you guys have any questions? Any general questions for me? They go well. They're having fun. Doing science, doing nerd stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I gave this, or pretty much this talk last year. Um, I'm not sure. You did this right last time, right? Yeah. You might have seen this, although it's changed just a little bit. Um, this talk isn't going to be about like control group and experimental group and uh, hypotheses and things like that. This is going to be more just to get you thinking about um, more of like the nitty gritty parts of designing good experiments. Um, I know most of you are like, most of you've done experiments. I don't can can really have you gotten all the way through doing a research project yet? Um, I don't know. <laughs> so, I, I think this might be, I think it will still be useful for you, but if you've done an experiment like to completion already, I think this will probably be a little, a little bit more better. Not, not saying that it won't be, but, um, but that's kind of my guess. Um, I think what, what I'm going to talk about here is, is less specifics and more like some general concepts to get you thinking. Because your projects might not involve all of these components, they might involve one, they might not involve any, but it's just good things to think about when, when you're designing experiments. So uh, I'm just going to, actually I guess I'll talk about this. This is a, a question that I posed this morning to the, uh, to the first group that I talked with. Like, well, what is experimental design? And I kind of like, this actually comes from a statistics textbook. It's not like a biology, like a biological research book. Um, but experimental design is purposeful integration. Thoughtful, right? It, it, it needs a lot of doing a good experiment requires a lot of forethought. And in school, because we're rushed with time, we usually kind of blow through the design part of the experiment. We just do the experiment. But you guys are at, you're all at the point where um, we want really well designed, really thoughtful experiments. So it's got to be thoughtful, purposeful, and then we're going to integrate research objectives. So to do a good experiment, you have to have a really clear idea of what is it that you want to achieve? What is it that you want to reveal? Or, or, uh, or um, uh, what, what, what's your end goal? So you have to have a clear objective. You have to know your data collection techniques. And so that's where the advisors come in. We really want you guys to come in with really clear ideas and objectives and questions. And then we can help you figure out, well, how, how am I going to collect the data that I need to collect? So if it's like last year with Julia's fruit flies and electrical impulses, you know, the shade and, and Mr. Brasky and Sirfoss, maybe we'll help you find probes that you can shove into fruit fly eyeballs and, and see if you can measure those impulses or the primers or the, the real-time PCR, things like that. But yeah, you obviously have to think of, you have to know that before you start the experiment. And then um, a big one that a lot of times I think student researchers save until after the, the experiment has been done, is once you get data, what are you going to do with it? So when you go into an experiment, you really need to have a pretty clear picture of, this is the kind of data that I'm, I know I'm going to collect, and then I have some ideas about what I'm going to do with it. So that might be, like, what are the statistical tests that we're going to run, but at the very least, having a pretty good idea of what that data is actually going to look like. Um, so a really good experiment combines all three of those, good objectives, uh, really sound techniques, um, and then very robust data analysis so that you get high quality results and, uh, and a, a large quantity of results, right? We want lots of information coming out of your experiments. And I think just kind of talking to you and knowing what you're interested in, all of your experiments have written a lot of potential. So I know that there's some changes this year, which is exciting, but, but all of you are, uh, all of you are right there. Okay. So that's kind of my, my spiel for experimental design. Um, I want to talk about this a little bit. So uh, there's these terms that we use in designing experiments, population and sample. And they're not the same as what we would think of as a biological population. So in biology class, a population is uh, members of the same species that have the potential to interbreed, right? But individuals that are close by. In statistics, and in, in experimental design, 
uh, a population is a group of things that's of interest to the researcher. So it's kind of like uh, if you're studying one specific species of plant, it's all individuals of that species of the plant. If it's, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of examples that might work for you guys. But I like to think of the population almost as uh, reality. So if you could, let's say for, let's go with, let's talk about Bren's project a little bit. So Bren's been measuring um, milk samples for levels of lactose. And so interested in lactose intolerance or lactose sensitivity. Uh, and we've been talking about like what's the thresholds, like what what's the level of lactose that triggers a response in people. And so that's the, po the population in her study, if we're dealing with the people, would, would be who? What would the population be in her study? This is a poorly worded question. <laughs> so, 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 right. so the the population would be everyone on Earth who has lactose sensitivity. So if we could do a study, if if we really wanted to find out, like what's the average threshold that people like the amount of lactose that they need to consume to have a bad reaction? In in theory, it's pretty simple. Go find every single person with lactose sensitivity, and see at what level they have a response. That makes sense. Can we do that? No. We can't. There's no way that we can go and physically, all right, eat this food, and okay, does your stomach hurt? Okay, we can't do that with everybody. So we do an experiment with a smaller subset, a sample, hoping that it reflects that your experiment reflects accurately on the entire population. Does that make sense? So a lot of what we're going to do uh, talking about experimental design is how do we make sure that our experiment, the, from the very small sample that we're able to collect as high school researchers, accurately reflects reality, the, the truth. Uh, and the frustrating thing about science is we never know if our results accurately reflect the population. But we can do a bunch of things to, to make it that more likely. Am I making any sense at all? Mm -hmm. I did, this is like the best little diagram here. Big sort of population sample. Um, and so, uh, I won't, I'll, this will just be kind of a hypothetical question for anyone to actually make an answer. What are the challenges to studying, to doing research, to, to make sure that our sample actually reflects the population? Well, one is um, usually uh, universe is because we can't make all the measurements. It's impractical. It doesn't make sense to go and measure everybody for lactose intolerance. Financially it's limiting. Uh, and so because of that, that's why we, we pick a sample. And so good experiments do a bunch of things to make sure that this sample represents the whole population. And I know, I, so I kind of twisted, brain, like, that's not really your project, but could we go out and find a hundred people or a thousand people that we could measure for their, their lactose threshold that would give us a pretty good reflection of the world population of people with lactose sensitivity? Um, can we pick enough fruit flies so that that little sample accurately represents all of fruit flies, right? Uh, and, and whatever other projects that might be. That's what a, that's what a good experiment does. Okay, questions? You guys are quiet. Makes me feel uncomfortable. So what the, the purpose of this talk is going to be, and, and again, I know not all of your experiments are going to require this. Um, your experiment last year did. So Dr. Serapelia really talked a lot about randomization and blocking, and, and those are the things that we're going to talk about here. Um, not many high school research projects incorporate these techniques. They're not difficult. It's just that we usually don't tell you that they exist. So if you can, it's going to make your projects that much better. So if you can go into, not, not that a lot of times when we do these seminars, we talk about, oh man, you're going to go to science fair and you're going to kill it, like, you're, going to be, you're going to be great. Um, 
but I'm, so I am going to say that right now. If you would take a project with some of these components to a science fair and you could talk to judges and explain why you randomized and that your project was a single blind versus a double blind study or any of these things, you're, you're going to blow them away. And it's going to be better science than, than what you would have done otherwise. So, so I'm just going to talk about a few ways that you can make sure you choose a representative sample so that the people or the flies or the plants that you decide to study are, are truthful or accurate representations of all of the people or all of the fruit flies or all of the uh, willow trees out there. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over this. I think the picture does it more. If you want to write some of that, you can. But, uh, how, do we, how do we make sure that we're not being biased? That our preconceived notions are affecting which, which, uh, which individuals we choose. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, um, like I said, are a couple of techniques that we use to, to maximize the chances that our sample reflects the whole population. Or uh, one of my favorite books out there, it's a super nerdy book, but uh, a good book nonetheless. There's a book called uh, The Signal and the Noise. So it's written by a guy named, um, I always forget, Nate Silver. You, Nate Silver Adams, do you know what I'm talking about? The guy who runs 20... Yeah, he does like the election data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's this statistician, but basically he predicts elections, he predicts how well baseball players are going to perform. But it's a book all about how do you... There's so much data out there in the world. Like imagine... I'm getting off topic already. Imagine trying to predict the weather on Saturday. How many individual data points could we collect to predict the weather in Ravazoni on Saturday? infinite, right? Temperature everywhere in the atmosphere, like from ground level all the way up, soil, temperature, humidity, wind patterns, and not just here, we also have to think about all of those data points, all of those metrics east and west and north and south here. But there has to be, um, among all of those data points, there have to be some that are meaningful, that will really tell us, what's the temperature, is it going to rain, what's the humidity on Saturday? So he calls um, the noise all of the data points that are, are there that just kind of get in the way. The signal is the good stuff. So we're going to talk about a couple of techniques that make it easier for us to tell as we're doing our experiment what's the mean, what's the good, st the good data that's going to help us come to a conclusion, and what's the, all the other data points that are just going to make it Just real quickly, you mentioned good data versus other data. There's never bad data. Data is, data are data. Technically. Data right, is right. data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's data. It's just a question of whether it is pointed towards your research or extraneous or variable or some other non-important information. I don't know if you said that, but no, no, I wanted to reiterate. That's a point. Okay, so how... How do we do that? How do we make sure that we are, what we're going to do, what your experiment is, is, as a high school researcher, is accurately reflect the real world. And so the simplest one is collect more data. Like we said, if you, if you could collect every single data point related to the question that you have, then you would have an answer. You would know what the average threshold is, or if we could collect every single possible data point, but we might be able to know for sure what exactly is going to happen on weather on Saturday in Ramazonia. We can't do that. But the closer you get to collecting all of the data, uh, the more reliable that study is going to be. But that's hard, right? So there's some other, there's some other ways we can do it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about randomization. So if you have a huge pool of data points, but you can only, you can only collect 100 data points, which ones do you so I'll show you. I'm, I tried to. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about examples in here, and if you if you think about examples as we go, kind of shout them out, and we'll, we'll see if they apply. Um, replication. I think this is a pretty simple one that you are all familiar with. Um, you can't just do an experiment one time. You need to replicate. So how many times do you run your control group versus or your experimental group? 
grid we were sitting down yesterday looking at that 96 wall plate, how many times do we have to do that negative control? How many times do we have each of those? So that, that's what we're talking about as far as replication. Uh, we're going to talk about something called blocking. Oh, that's a really simple concept. The, the word might not be familiar, but you'll understand that uh, really easily. Um, there's a concept called blinding in experiments. So um, sometimes you, as the researcher, are your own worst enemy. Your preconceived notions might affect the results. Or we're human, so usually when we do an experiment, we don't want the results to turn out out some way. So we might be slightly more likely to interpret the results so that we get that. Like there's nothing worse than doing an experiment, like uh, no difference between control group and experiment group. But sometimes that's the truth. So we can do things to prevent your wants or your desires for the experiment to affect the results. Um, and then I, I don't know if I'm even going to talk about this too much, but the way that we kind of structure the experiment, what we would call treatment structure. So um, we'll, we'll just talk. There's like a slide on each of these, and we'll talk about some. Uh, just so you know, this lecture comes from my master's level uh, experimental design and statistics um, course that I took at the University of Maryland a couple years ago. So this is not stuff that most other high school students are learning, and it's not stuff that most other even like undergrads are learning. This is this is pretty advanced statistics or advanced experimental design and statistics. So if there are things that don't make sense, you're like, I don't think my experiment's ever going to get close to that. That's okay. Right? There's, there's going to be things here that are we're going beyond probably what you need to know right now. But it's not that you can't understand it. it I'm, like, I'm not worried about that at all. So anyway, like I, like I mentioned before, incorporating even one or two or three of these, which is not really not terribly difficult, uh, will, will increase the quality of your give you a better experiment. Like Sir said, there's no bad data. Maybe increase the likelihood that your data will give you reveal meaningful uh, meaningful information. Okay. Questions so far? Camera's still good. Okay. Alright, so let's talk about randomization. I think this is a, a fairly straightforward uh, principle. Anyone know what we're looking at here in this picture? Some of you have to. Maybe not the little dots, but Mr. Moraski, is it a uh, auger plate colonies? Mm -hmm. This is probably not on the auger plate, no. but it's a very good guess. This is a, a, a microscope image of cells under a hemocytometer. So. What you would do if you're, if you're growing cells in liquid media, I don't know what these cells. Let's let's imagine they're red blood cells. They're not. They're not. But that would make it easy. So let's say you take a sample of blood, and you want to see how many red blood cells are there per milliliter of of, uh, of blood in this sample. So what you would do is take some out of your your individual, whatever organism you're taking it from. You would put it on the hemocytometer, and then you cover it with a covered with like a cover slip sheet of glass and so the end result is you know the exact volume of liquid of blood underneath the glass and then there, there's no dimensions to these so we know the volume of, of liquid under this image and so what you can do is just count right you can say all right if these are red blood cells one two three four five seven blah, blah, blah. you can do some simple math and say all right there's there would be um, 8,500 cells per 100 microliters of blood or something like that. And then you could take a diseased, you know, let's say these are frogs, you could take a diseased frog and compare if it's way higher or way lower, you, know, you, can, you can make some sense. Anyway, so we're looking at cells underneath the microscope. That makes sense. We do this stuff here, we just don't have any cell culture. So I think I'm just kind of like talking about an example. So human selection of a sample from a population can introduce bias. Into it. So let's say um, we want to count how many cells there are here, but let's let's say there's too many to actually count all of them under here. What we can do is count a smaller subset um, so that 
we don't have to count all of the cells, but we're pretty sure we're going to get an accurate number. And so the idea is, instead of counting everywhere, let's say, well, let's just count the cells in five of these little blocks. And then we can use that to estimate how many cells there are total. And we do, we do the same thing on a Petri dish, right? So if there's like, I don't know, uh, let's say 1,500 colonies of uh, uh, bacteria on a Petri dish, but uh, I don't want to count all this. Is it reasonable to say that, well, we could count the cells on half of the Petri dish and then multiply it by two, and that'll give us an estimate of how many total colonies there are, right? We can do the same thing here. So if we know the volume of each one of these squares, we can, we can use that to estimate how many cells there are. So if you were going to, let's say we were only going to count the cells in five of these little squares, which five do we pick? How, how could we pick five? Should we count one, two, three, four, five? Or one, two, three, four, five? Or say, uh, that looks like it has a lot, that looks like it has a lot, that looks like it has a lot. Are any of those better or worse? Are any of those random? No, like our bot, our, our human bias is uh, impacting that, that count probably. So if you would read a statistics textbook, that what they would say is the, the, probably the best way, the fairest way to count these would be number random, or not randomly, number every square. One, two, three, five, right? Maybe there's 50 squares there. And then use a random number generator. To, okay, so you say, all right, pick a number at random from 1 to 50. 47. Okay, we're going to count this one. Pick again. Number 3. Okay, we're going to count this one. Number 6. It doesn't seem close together. Maybe we should. It doesn't matter, right? It's, it's a random number generator. So those would be the five that you would count. Does that make sense? Um, th now, this is just one example. Can you think of other times when randomization trying to think about your, so maybe in Janae, you had, your experiment was small enough. Janae had a bunch of buckets with four different kinds of willow plants. Um, and so yours was small enough that we could count or met whatever Dr. Serpili is doing, right? You, you could, we could count every, like, or measure every plant. But let's say you have a, a, an acre of corn grown with a pesticide an acre of corn growth without, and you want to measure like average average growth. Can we measure every corn plant? No. So how do you pick randomly from both fields to make sure that you're getting an accurate reflection? Probably, I don't know, if in a in a trial like that, maybe every corn plant has a GPS tag. And so you do a random number generator and say, okay, this one, this one, right? And you let you make it truly random. I don't know if that example helped at all, but in cases where we can't, we just can't take the time or the effort, or it's too hard to count every individual sample in our in our sample, then we need to pick randomly. The fruit flies were kind of like that. I know you're kind of you're moving away from the fruit flies, but if you have a vial of like a thousand flies, you're not going to take all of them out and measure. So last year when you did that you probably grabbed the slowest ones that you were able to get out of the vial, right? Is that random? Probably not. Now, if I could, are you going to number every fly and, oh crap, I have to find number 437? Probably not going to. So there's some limitations to this, but as you're starting to design your experiments, um, think about randomization. How can, you, how can you make sure that your data is truly randomized? If you're going out in the environment and trying to find frogs or, or salamanders, I don't, we'd have to read about what that kind of randomization would look like, um, but you're, but there's going to be some bias there. Like uh, again, I'm catching all the slowest salamanders. <laughs> so, so is that truly random? Probably not. There, there's some, there's some collection bias. There. Okay. Does the idea of randomization make sense? Okay. Anything to add, Sir Phyllis? Right. I've done studies where uh, we're outside doing samples, um, looking at plants and seeing like what insects are associated with plants. And when you go outside, your automatically eye is going to be drawn to certain samples. So um, when I was doing 
teaching undergrads is we'd actually take a hula hoop and they would toss the hula hoop and wherever the hula hoop would land, yeah. it would be like your random sample and you would just sense this what's in there. Even though there might be a plant right next to it that you want to count, you're limited to what is in that hoop. So it's really important. There's lots of parts where you're collecting data and you're putting in bias. You may not think you are, but you are. And if, if you take that into account when you're setting up your design, you, you can talk about it. It really sets you apart. Yeah. I did research, kind of similar, I, I did research at Penn State for a summer. Worst job ever. <laughs> Don't, do not do this. Um, in the Penn State, plant science, and more specifically, the weed science department. And so what they were doing is, uh, kind of like I said with the corn, they had these field plots of corn and alfalfa and all the wheat and all these different crops, and then they would try different um, ways of suppressing weeds. So they would do a natural like straw cover, and then they would do uh, pesticide, uh, like herbicide combinations to kill the weeds and stuff. But my job as a college intern was, go out and take a quadrat, which is like a meter by meter square, broken up into smaller, meters, kind of like this, but imagine three feet, three feet, three feet. And just like uh, Ryan said, or Mr. Rassi, just throw it into the uh, field, wherever it lands, I counted and identified every single weed in that little three book. There's a lot, if you think a meter by meter, there's a lot of weeds that pop up in that, even that small space. So if, it was, if I got to choose, and it was at the end of the day, so I was hot and sweating, you know, seven hours out in the field, uh, you know, in central Pennsylvania, 90 degree heat. I was probably going to choose where there were the fewest weeds, but that's that's not how it worked, right? So they would assign me, okay, you have to go in this section of the field. It's been randomized, it's been randomly selected for today, and then you randomly uh, like pick an area, an area to choose, or kind of throw the quadrat out into that area. So sampling of the environment oftentimes requires interesting. Highly recommend not being an intern in Penn State Weed Science Department. And <laughs> depending on the organism you're monitoring, your sampling technique will be different. Because if it's wildlife that's moving around, yeah. compared to plants that, last I checked, can't just uproot themselves and walk away to a different spot. Right? So your, your sampling technique has to be different if you're looking at migratory birds, for instance, or yeah. uh, something that's going to be moving around. So that's something that we should, you know. For first time, just finding some amphibians would probably be good for us. But um, if we wanted to have publishable data, we, we would need to randomize. Think about that. Okay. Question? Question? Yeah. Uh, replication. This should be a fairly quick one. Um, I don't even know. That's kind of a general statement. I'll have to write that down. Um, Having replication or duplicating the, the trials of your experiment obviously are, uh, is going to give you more reliable data for a couple of reasons. Um, and like we mentioned earlier, anytime you can increase your sample size closer to the, the population, uh, your results are more reliable. The other reason why having lots of data points is is useful, and this is more of a statistics thing, and I know you, most of you haven't had much in the way of statistics yet. One of the, one of the most important things that we need to determine when we collect data is, okay, we're looking for threat, well, let's go back to British example, we're looking for what's the threshold that people with um, lactose intolerance have, like what's the level of lactose that will give them a, a reaction? But there's natural variation within the population. Some people who are lactose intolerant, the teeniest, tiniest bit of lactose, boom, they're going to have a bad reaction. Other people might be able to eat a bowl of ice cream and have no reaction. If they eat a second bowl of ice cream, boom, they get, they get that reaction. Or they drink a, eight ounces of liquid milk and they have their reaction. So not, it's not only important to figure out averages and some of the, the more common kinds of statistics, it's also really important to learn what's the natural variation of this phenomenon of your independent variables in the population. Uh, you've prob we've made you calculate some of those statistics. The, really, the number that I'm thinking of. Do you know what, I'm, what we're talking about here when we talk about what what statistic estimates variation within a population? We probably made you do it with Excel. Standard deviation is, is kind of what I'm thinking of. 
does, does that make sense, or does that sound familiar to everybody? So, uh, in a population, maybe, so let's look at something like height. If you would take all people living in the United States, we want to find the average height. Uh, maybe the, let's say the, we were able to figure that out, let's say the average is uh, five foot, five feet seven inches. But there's obviously a lot of variation. So the highest person might be, I don't know, what's the tallest person, like seven something? Probably. Seven, eight, really tall. And the seven. shortest person, I don't know, like three, three two foot something. I don't, so there's big variation. We, in order to really understand our data, yeah, we, it's nice to know the average, but we also need to understand what's that variation within the population. And so by replicating and collecting more data, not only do we get closer to the population, we're also able to estimate what's, or measure, what's the standard deviation in this population? This, this number is average. Within this range is kind of normal. So if we get a data point way above or way below, is that normal or is that something, like, is something meaningful going on in that data? Am I making sense to them? Okay. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but basically when you're designing your experiment, you want to think about is 10 flies enough? Is 100 flies enough? Is 1,000 flies enough? Is we're limited by money, we're limited by time, we're limited by uh, availability of, of materials, but, uh, but it's important to get some So I can pass that quickly. Anything to add? Is your boss for asking? So I just talked about this, some of these seem kind of like oxymorons, we just talked about the importance of randomization. So we want to, we want to you know, there's a bunch of data points out there, we want to randomly sample so that we're not in introducing bias. But there's another concept called standardization that kind of seems counterintuitive, it's not, it's not an oxymoron, like you can do randomized and standardized data at the same time, but we'll have to explain. So there are procedures in an experiment that reduce, uh, so like, there's always going to be natural variation in the data that you collect, like we said in heights. You're going to have tall people, you're going to have short people. Uh, you're going to have people with really severe lactose sensitivity, you're going to have people with really low so lactose sensitivity. But there are things that, so we can't, well, that's real, that we're, we don't want to change that. But we can reduce variation in our data that is caused by us not variation that actually exists. And so by standardizing either procedures or the way that we collect samples, we can reduce some of that noise. Uh, the way that, probably the way that you would, we would best think about that, if you think back to like biology or some class where we talk about variables, independent variable is what we change purposely in the experiment. Dependent variable is the result of that of the data that we collect. What are the other kinds of variables called? You were here this morning. Say it? Yeah, say it. Extraneous are these confounding variables. They're things that, if we don't control well, will mess up our experiment. So what we can do is make sure that we're not accidentally introducing any more confounding or extraneous variables than, than are absolutely necessary. So two ways of doing that, sample uniformity and procedural uniformity. So sample doing or kind of ensuring sample uniformity is reducing any natural uh, variability uh, of the things that we introduce in the experiment. So uh, that, that probably does make a lot of sense. Let me try to give you an example. Let's say you're a pharmaceutical researcher and you're testing a new drug on rats with uh, MS. So you say, all right, we think we have a, a drug that's really going to work for MS. We're going to try it in rats. What rats do you, you want rats with MS, but what rats do you select? That's probably not a good question either. 
Yeah, but rats can get at rats. Well, yeah, I have no idea that. But probably they can. But anyway, uh, let's yeah, pick another cancer. Uh, thyroid cancer. It's a rat. You want to you want to test a drug for thyroid cancer on rats. So we're gonna first find rats that have thyroid cancer. But if we just select any rats that happen to have thyroid cancer, uh, there's going to be, we're, we're going to find, we're going to run into issues. We're int probably introducing variation that we don't, actually, we don't really want. So if you take two totally unrelated ra uh, rats with thyroid cancer, genetically they're very different. Right? So a drug might work for one, but not for the other. And, and that's, that, that happens in people too. But if you're doing an experiment, you want, the, you want to control, even, even that level, like the genetics of your test samples, you want to control those things. So the way that researchers, pharmaceutical research actually deals with that is they clone mice. And they give them the same kind of cancer, and then they test. That makes sense. So it's not just picking the same species of rat. It's not just picking rat, two rats from the same litter. We're getting to the point where we want to control things so much, we're going to clone them so that we're absolutely sure they're genetically identical. Now, can we do that in our experiments? Probably not. But uh, as far as sample uniformity, like Bryn, if, you're, if we're going to, Bryn was making lactose solutions and like testing them to see if our, our measurement techniques are going to be accurate. Uh, if you're going to do that a bunch of times, you want to make sure that if we're kind of optimizing our technique, you want to make sure that your lactose solution, they're all coming from the same batch. Because if you use different water one time, then the next time, the results might be different. Not because they should be, not because the machinery is messing up, but because we, we as humans didn't optimize, we didn't make the samples uniform. Does that make sense? The fruit flies, I, I don't like, are they from the same stock too? Um, are they the same age? You wouldn't want to do an experiment with, um, this, is, this would be a terrible experimental design, but if you want to test the effect of, I, I talked earlier, bioactive glass on, um, on plant growth, in your experiment, unless plant species is part of your design, you want to do the same species, and you want to make sure that they're the same age, and maybe they come from the same batch of seeds, so we, we can do that kind of controlling to a certain degree. We're not going to go out and get you cloned rats for your experiments. But uh, we can we can pretty well. When, when the shade by cell lines, we do. We make sure that they're taken from the same um, same stock to the same bio to make sure that our sample is uniform. And then a procedural uniformity, this is more what you do. So kind of like going back to Bryn's experiment, uh, we want to make sure that the way that we record data is done the same way every time. So if you're going to collect 100 data points, uh, you have to make sure that you do it the same way every time. Um, last year we had uh, Haley from Oak did an experiment with foam in a, in a riding helmet for horses. And so we put a sensor in the helmet and then, uh, I'm going to be caught on camera saying this, so, but probably wasn't real well done the way that we did it. She measured the first time, like, okay, roughly, like, th th four feet off the ground, and drop it ten times, recording the data. Uh, but is that really procedural uniformity? Was it exactly the same rate every time? Um, probably not, right? So there, there are little things there. When we measured the electrical impulses in the fruit fly, did we get those probes exactly in the same place every time? Probably not, because they were like wiggling around and trying to escape you from jamming those things in there. Um, even plant growth, like, are you really measuring from the same part on the plant to the same part on the plant every time? So um, how do we achieve good procedural uniformity? That, again, that's kind of a um, theoretical question. Be really careful and really thinking it out before we start. This is really hard, for the most part. This is, this, it, the concept is pretty simple. Yeah, don't, don't pick two different kinds of rats. But in, in theory or in practice, it, it's definitely true. Okay, questions on standardization?
going to have like, uh, I only really want to talk about two more. Um, blocking, um, again, these are all ways to kind of make up for natural variation that you'll have in, in, um, in a study. The example that I talk about with blocking, um, I always talk about Joe Bersoy. So I hate to pick on Joe, especially since he's not here to defend himself anymore. He had a really great project a couple of years ago. Could have been a lot better if he had blocked his data. And so blocking is when you basically match or pair experimental or parts of your experiment into groups, into subsets. So the example, I'll, I'll talk about Joe's example here in a little bit, but the example that's here first is, let's say you're interested in determining what, how much force or how much impact is needed to cause a concussion in a fruit fly. Obviously, we probably don't care about fruit flies that much, but like for a, a youth soccer player or a youth football player, what force is needed to cause a concussion? Uh, so, what you could do if we're going to do this with fruit flies is just randomly pick a hundred fruit flies and hit them against the side of a test tube at various forces, and then measure them to see if they have a concussion. I don't know how you do it, but measure to see if they have a concussion or not. So you could just have one big pool, fruit flies. But how else could we subdivide those, those individual fruit flies so that we could, we could pull out more meaningful data from those 100? How could we group the individuals of that population? Yeah. Like size, weight. Sure, size or age or something like that. Yeah, we can do that. How else? Five of you sitting, staring. One of the. There's four males in here and five females, separated by gender. Do males and females get concussions equally? I don't know about fruit flies. For humans, it's a no. Females get concussions way more easily, and we're still trying to figure out why. Uh, age. If you take a really young fruit fly um, versus an old fruit, old and fruit fly, it's probably a couple days, right? So, it, is an old fruit fly more or less likely to get a concussion than a young fruit fly? I don't know, but but you could you could block the data so that you can figure that out. So, if we go back to Joe's experiment. Um, so we could block or match them into categories: age, gender, uh, the fly strain. We could do this with wingless. Do wingless fruit flies get concussions more easily? Right. Um, for Joe's experiment, he was interested in gluten sensitivity in people. So, people, if you take people who are diagnosed as being uh, having celiac disease, people who self-describe themselves as having gluten sensitivity, and then people who are self-described as absolutely no gluten sensitivity, I can eat pancakes for breakfast bread for lunch and pasta for dinner, and I have no ill effects. Um, like, can we, can we kind of find those thresholds? Kind of like bring what, what I've been faking your experiment as, is like the, those threshold levels. He collected saliva samples from people, like 20 people, and measured them, did all kinds of tests, and tried to figure out when would we get a, an immune response in the saliva to, 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 uh, to gluten. But he forgot to label his samples. He didn't know which ones came from men, which ones came from women, which, one came, which ones came from teenagers, which came from adults, which ones were collected in the morning, which samples were collected in the evening. We had no clue. And that was a huge flaw in his experiment. So if you have 20 data points, and it's not a ton, but it's, it's about the time to, he asked 20 people to spit in tubes and they, and they did it for him, right? But if we could have blocked that data, it probably, he didn't find any trends. He, he didn't really find any results. We couldn't tell the difference from saliva whether they were, uh, they were, like what that threshold was. But maybe if he had separated the, the men and the women, we would have seen, the data would have made more sense. So maybe men have a much higher or a much lower threshold than women. If we separate them, those patterns in the data would, would come out. That makes sense. So, usually in high school, we're asking you guys to simplify the experiment. 100 fly, right? That's it. But 
Doing this doesn't change how you collect the data, it's the analysis afterwards and some note taking. Did this sample come from a man or a woman? Was it, uh, what was their age? What time was the sample collected? And whatever else. We seem to keep going back to this. But that, that is blocking. And then, as you can imagine, things are crazy, you can randomize within those blocks. Your experiment, if these words are sounding familiar, it was called a randomized block experiment. Right? So you randomized, but we had, um, so yeah, we had like, yeah, randomization within each block that we did. Yeah. Yes, we have time. Sorry, let's hear The video is ruined. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to try to, I'll be done by one o'clock here. So I'll be under one hour. Do we have time on the camera? Plenty of time. So I can talk longer? Yeah. Right. Um, so let's say you know this is another like kind of pharmaceutical clinical trial. You get volunteers for a study. Let's say you get a thousand volunteers. You would obviously code them as being male or female, um, and then some of them are going to get the drug, get the treatment. Some of them are going to get placebo. That would be randomized. Who gets what within the study? So this is just kind of this is my simple effort to show you, start showing you like. How you can you can block them into different subcategories, but then you would be randomizing each of those, or you would be doing standardization of your data collection techniques. I think this is the last one that I was I was uh, going to talk about. We've only done this one time here at Conrad that I can remember. Uh, so there's a concept in it called blinding. Blinding is a technique that specifically tries to remove your bias as a researcher. So, like I, I kind of mentioned there a little bit earlier, we're human. You guys are picking projects that you're really passionate about, and um, you probably want the results. That, it's it's exciting when you're a scientist that you get significant results, right? Um, and so, we're, if you know. Our results are kind of iffy when we're doing uh, real-time PCR, trying to define, trying to find contrario mycosis in these amphibians. Realistically, we probably want to know. So we're going to be looking at for a fungal disease in amphibians uh, with Ireland's project. Hopefully, we'll find nothing. The researcher in us probably is saying, like, oh, I hope we find some of this really hor horrific worldwide fungal infection in, in our amphibians here, because it'd be fun to talk about, right? But um, but our, our kind of subconscious wants or desires will probably could influence our results or the way that we interpret data. So this is especially true where when we collect data that it's a little bit blurry. Like when we were doing um, our uh, HPLC, it's like, oh, is that a little blip? I think that's a little blip. Let's zoom in. And, and um, the researcher from Kutztown was like, I wouldn't be confident saying that that's a blip. We're like, oh, yeah, that's a blip. We really, want, we really want that to be a little bit of lactose. In reality, what we should have done is blinded ourselves as the researchers to which samples we were analyzing. And so you can do this a couple of ways. Um, this is probably more true for medical studies, but also can be true for, for other kinds of studies. Um, a single blind experiment or a single blind design is when information is designed to the patients in an experiment. The researchers know what's going on, the patients don't. Now, none of you are going to be using or working with patients that are human, I hope. So we won't really have to worry about that. If your patients are fruit flies, you don't need to <laughs> with all the information from that. They don't know what's going on in there. But if you say, if you're interested in like, uh, you know, a, a drug for, uh, go, let's go back to thyroid cancer, if you say to a, a person, a patient with thyroid cancer, we're in, you know, we'd like you to enroll in the study, we're going to give you this drug that might treat your thyroid cancer, 
and you tell them that, they're going to be thinking, oh, man, I'm getting this treatment. I think I'm getting better. Right? It's going to affect the result. So uh, there's the idea of the placebo effect. So what you would do is you would take people with thyroid cancer and break them into two groups. Some of them actually get the drug. Some of them don't. But they don't know which group. They all take a little pill that looks the same. Some of it is just a sugar cube, and some of it's actually a drug. It's kind of crappy when you think about it, because if you're a person truly afflicted by that disease, thyroid cancer, and you sign up because you're going to be part of a drug trial, but they give you a sugar pill, it's kind of crappy that they're not actually giving you some drug or medication that would work. But that placebo effect is absolutely work, yeah. right? We, we've seen drugs where the placebo effect is greater yeah. than what the actual chemical or yeah. what they created. Yeah, I mean, even like when I start to get sick, I always take like a vitamin C thing, like a vitamin C pill. Does it really help me? Well, there's very questionable uh, science there, but it makes me feel better, so why, why not take it? Even if it's really doing nothing, and just in my head, I think I'm feeling better. So that that idea, we we do things to minimize that effect. We're probably not gonna have to worry about single line designs unless. It's more of like a survey-based thing where we're asking people, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that too. too. The other kind of uh, blinding system is double blind. So you, you've probably heard about this. Like uh, That tends to be like a popular phrase if you read a, or hear something on the news like, in a new double blind trial, blah, 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 blah. Double blind just means information about the study is denied to both the patient and the researcher. I think we did this with Rini last year. Uh, and so it wasn't really, I don't know if I'm calling it double She was using, doing cell culture with wasp venom. So the cells didn't know and the wasps didn't, but whatever. But um, Ms. Shade and I coded the plates, coded the samples, so that Rini didn't know what she was counting. We just said, okay, Rini, count number 467. And she would go underneath the microscope and say, okay, there's bubble blood cells there. So, okay, now now count sample 322. She would go in and she would count 322. But Rini, as the researcher, had no idea if she was counting a control group or the experimental group, the cells with the venom added. So we tried to eliminate her bias as she was collecting the data. And that that's probably, we should be doing more of that. Uh, it takes more cooperation, Sirfoss or I or Shade or whoever. We, we could withhold information from you while you're counting and then tell you afterwards. So you can say, wow, like there really was a huge difference. And I didn't just make it up in my head. <laughs> uh, so that, that's, what, that's what we mean by that. Any thoughts, questions? I think that's done. Isn't that done for, uh, thinking back at food science, they, uh, for case testing? Yeah. Oh, for yeah. like quality control for new products, they'll bring in like a panel. If you go to Penn State, you can, they'll pay you to come in and sample these foods. And, They'll give you like a new product they're considering, but you may not know that's, if it's like changed or the. That's probably single blind. That's single blind because the person, oh, the researcher, the, the researcher yeah. needs to know what well, samples they're now. They will vary the numbers. Yeah. The, but they can be double blind because the person giving the food to the, yeah, the test subject is not. Yeah. The yeah. Has, has, has no clue what's what. But the the research researcher is well. The tech one. must know what's what. Oh yeah, tech in order to what. send. So the, the the lead researcher, the PhD, the or the company might not know. Yeah. It could be the middleman that knows. So I guess yeah. theoretically, that's what I think. I think of a blind study. Yeah, taste testing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. blind taste testing. But it, the the whole concept is just we're moving as much bias as, bias as possible. <laughs> Any and all bias that you can remove is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and. I, I think, you know, I guess I'll talk. This is, this is uh, fairly simple. I know it applies to at least, at least the Brains Project. Uh, so I'm going to go here. See if I can do this in 55 seconds. Uh, control, the, in your control group, a lot of times you say, oh, you need a control group. Control groups get more complicated. Than that. Um, and actually, Ireland, your, your project, too, uh, will deal with this. You can have many different kinds of control groups, but typically we break them down into negative controls and positive controls. So for Ireland, what we're going to do, we're going to go out 
into Pennsylvania, Brooks County, whatever. We're going to try to find amphibians. We're going to swab their bellies with uh, like a sterile swab and, and then save the sample and bring it back to the lab. And what we're going to do is, using some molecular techniques, we're going to see if there's evidence of the, the fungus that causes the infection based on DNA. And so when we put the samples into our machine, there's really going to be one of two answers. Yes, there's fungus here, or no, there's not. But if we get a no, there's nothing here. But there's two options. What, what could be the case? What, like, what, what, yeah, how can we interpret those results? Either we screwed up, or there's actually a fungus. Yeah, either our test isn't detecting the fungus that's actually there, or there really is no fungus there. So in order to, to really verify which of those is true, we would need both a negative control and a positive control. So what we would need to do is, at the same time, load into the machine a sample that has DNA from that fungus, so that we would see what, and this it looks like a curve, so we'd say, okay, here's the positive curve. We would need to load a sample that absolutely, without a doubt, does not have the fungus, so we get a negative, and then we just compare our unknown samples poor little frog that's out in Furnace Creek to see, oh, uh, that's a positive or no, that's a negative. So not all experiments are going to have a positive and a negative control, but a lot of experiments are. Pretty, we've been doing that, right? So we know the sample has lactose, we know the sample doesn't have lactose, and then what are all the unknown ones? Uh, so, so like I said, there's, this is, these are, uh, techniques that all of us should probably be implementing into our experiments. It's not feasible to always do it in every experiment, but hopefully it just gets you thinking a little bit about, about your experiments and, and maybe we can add one or two of these uh, into your project. So I think that's it. Any questions? Alright. Thanks for listening to that.